So that's that is a vertical stress. We'll have to hold off on talking about how you measure the horizontal stresses for a while. But so far in our discussion of stress, we've sort of left out one important detail, and that is that the rock we're interested in has fluid in it. And so if we were to take out our sort of characteristic stress cube, cut it away from the surface, and we apply the far field tectonic stresses or tractions to it, we can't ignore the fact that there's fluid in it, and that fluid also exerts a force on the rock. So any, if you were to take sort of any smaller section of, uh, of the rock, you know, that's, that's, that's in the matrix itself, that part is going to be subject to the external forces, right, the external stresses, as well as the forces due to pore pressure. Right? So we'll call that pore pressure. And so what we use to account for that is something called effective stress. So we know that pressure is a scalar, right? Thermodat thermodynamically, what is the pressure? It's the rate of change of internal energy with respect to volume. Right? So internal energy is a scalar, volume is a scalar, and pressure must be a scalar. Uh, so since pressure is a scalar, uh, and we need to somehow combine it into our tensor measure of stress. Well, it turns out that you know pressure is is also acts isotropically on a body. Right? So, you know, if I were to uh, if I were to take a cube of rock and submerse it into a, a fluid and pressurize that fluid somehow, like maybe have a cylinder right? push on the <coughs> cylinder, uh, it's not just going to push on the top of the rock, right? It's going to push on all sides of the rock equally. Iso so it's going to uh, be applied to the rock isotropically. And so we have this scalar pressure, but it, but it acts on the material in an isotropic way. And so then our definition of effective stress uh, is like this. So we, we, we subtract the pore pressure from the diagonal entries of the stress tensor. And of course, you know, if we write this in more compact notation, tensor notation, like this is our stress tensor S, then we just say that this is the pore pressure times the identity matrix. Right. So this is the effective stress. Sometimes you'll see it written like S prime or uh, you know, S effective. And you know, so there, there it's written as one tensor. And we'll see later that faulting, uh, we're going to learn really soon, that's sort of the first application uh, we're going to learn in this class is that uh, is on uh, faulting. And faulting depends on the effective stress. So essentially you have some stress holding a fault closed. And there's a fluid pressure in the fault. And if that pressure exceeds the frictional strength of the rock, which is associated with the stress, then it'll open that fault and the fault will slip. So it's a, uh, dependent on the effect of stress. Also, the strength of the rock itself is also dependent on the effect of stress. So if I increase the pore pressure, if I continue to increase the pore pressure such that I put the rock into tension, what's going to happen? Hmm. Are, rocks, are rocks strong in tension? Just intuitively, do you know that? They're pretty strong in compression. They're really strong if you can find them and put them in compression. So who's at lab yet? A few of you. So you did unconfined compressive strength on rock, right? So that's where you just squeeze a rock with a, you know, mechanically from the top and bottom um, and measure its strength, you know, stress-strain curve. Um, 
Later in the class, we'll do a triaxial test where you'll confine that rock. And you'll see that the rock, same rock, much, much stronger when you confine it. Right? But even a confined rock is not terribly strong in tension, so if I increase the pore pressure, put the rock in a tension, I'm going to fail the rock. And of course, this is the mechanism of hydraulic fracturing. 